Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Tree Identification for Beginners. We're pleased that so many of you have joined us this evening. We'd love to hear where you're from and what your interests are. So if you'd like, uh, go down to the chat feature and put in some information about yourself and we'll share that. My name is Mike Fargione. I'm the manager of field research and outdoor programs at the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. The Cary Institute is an independent ecological research and educational organization. We're located in southeastern New York. Our scientists study forests and fresh waters. They look at urban ecology and disease ecology, and they do their work both here in New York and around the world. Tonight's program is a collaborative effort between myself and Julie Hart from the Dutchess Land Conservancy, and we're glad to be with you. Julie and I are unashamed to uh, label ourselves as tree geeks. We can't wait to get out and see how our favorite trees are coming to life as we move towards spring. But we don't need to wait. Let's start tonight. Let's learn how we can identify some common trees here in the Northeast region of the, of the country. Normally we do this as a three hour in-person workshop each spring. We take walks out in the woods, we get samples that people can hold and examine, and we can't wait to get back to that format someday soon. But tonight we'll focus on highlighting some easy characteristics that beginners can find to identify common trees. You don't have to take notes tonight. Later, we will send you a link to the recording of the presentation and we'll send you links to the copies of our PowerPoints. You can download these to review details we won't have time to cover this evening. So just sit back and listen, and we hope you enjoy it. We've included a short video in amongst the presentations. We hope this conveys to you something of a sense of being out in the woods that we all miss so much. If you hover your mouse along the bottom of the screen, you'll see the Q&A feature. In a few minutes, we will turn off the chat if you have questions, we ask you to put them in the Q&A and we'll answer as many of them as we can as we get to the end. So now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Julie Hart. Julie. Thank you, Mike, and welcome everyone. It's so nice to see you all virtually um, on this lovely evening. And I'm so glad that you could all join us. So my name is Julie Hart. I'm an ecologist at the Dutchess Land Conservancy. We're a land trust that's located in Millbrook, New York. We're actually right down the road from the Cary Institute. And we work throughout Dutchess County and the surrounding areas to protect land for community benefit. We also provide education programs to encourage good stewardship of the land. And so really pleased to be part of this presentation tonight. As Mike said, um, trees are one thing that we, every, almost everybody has in common. And the desire to learn more about trees is something that almost everybody that we talk to expresses an interest in. So we're very, very glad to, to be with you tonight. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. And we'll go right into this. Okay, so can you see my screen okay? I'm gonna take that as a yes. So we will, first I'll give you an overview of what we're going to be doing tonight. So first of all, we'll be going through an introduction on tree identification, kind of some of the basic features that you should be looking for. And as Mike said, that'll include a, a short video that we did of our, you know, us out in the woods doing that kind of informal tree ID walk that we wish we could be doing. Um, and then we will talk about how to learn a simple identification key of which there are a lot of different types. So we'll run you through the basics on that as a way that you can you know, identify trees yourself out in the field. And then we will be breaking the trees into groups um, and I'll talk about that in a second, how we decided um, which groups to do. But, um, but I just wanted to point out that, you know, if, if you think that we can teach you all about how to identify every single tree in an hour, you probably think that's not possible. And, and you'd be totally right, that is a tall order. So what we're hoping to accomplish is really to give you the tools that you need to empower you to go out there and start learning these trees on your own. So I noticed in the chat that a lot of people are coming in from outside the area. We are focusing on trees that are common and local here in the Northeast. So um, 
when we get to the Q&A, I hope that we're focusing on trees that we actually know. You might end up asking us questions that we can't possibly answer if you're from a far different corner of the globe. Uh, but we do want to provide you with the tools that you need to do tree ID on your own. So the categories that we're going to be covering are very broad botanical categories. And if you look at most tree guides, they will break trees into these three groups. So we refer to them as alternate, evergreen, and opposite. So the twig on the far left is a twig of an alternately branching tree. And you can see how the buds on that twig are appearing on alternate sides of the twig. The one in the middle is clearly what we would call an evergreen. And the one on the right is what we would call an opposite branching twig. And so this branching goes from the twigs all the way through the branches everywhere on this tree. You will see the twigs and the buds coming out of the twig on opposite. They're directly opposite each other on the twig. So just to give you a sense of the categories that we're going to be using tonight. Now, we wanted to start with a little bit of a question. Why bother? Why does everybody get so interested in identifying trees? Why should we care about it? Well, there's a lot of different reasons for this. Trees matter. They provide habitat for wildlife. They provide a lot of products that we use, our homes and most of our furniture is built out of wood from the forest. We, this time of year, you know, we especially are enjoying the fresh forest product known as maple syrup that many local folks are tapping and boiling down from the maple sap. And of course, outdoor recreation. Think of it as human habitat, people outdoors enjoying the trees. Trees also work hard. There are a lot of essential functions that trees perform both individually and in the large groups of trees that we would call woods or forests. It's thanks to trees that we have soils and it's thanks to the tree roots that the soils don't wash away in a rainstorm. The trees are also producing oxygen and filtering our air and the root systems and the soils are filtering and purifying the water that we drink. Trees are in trouble, another great reason to be able to identify trees. Um, if you can identify a tree to species, you'll be, and you're aware of the different types of diseases and pests that are in your area, you'll be able to be alert for which specific species of tree would be most susceptible to, a diff to each different kind of pest. It's like posting your 911 address. You know what the firefighters always say, if we can't find you, we can't help you. And the same thing with tree ID. If you can identify a tree, you can be of more use to it. You'll be able to be alert for those incoming pests and pathogens that are coming into our area. So there are a lot of tree diseases and pests that we have. Some of them have been here for quite a long time. And many of these have significantly reduced the populations of the target species that they affect. You know, chestnuts were once very common in this area, and now they exist only as small saplings. When they get above a certain size, the blight hits them and the main trunk dies. It's not uncommon to find a chestnut around here, but they never get big due to the chestnut blight. There are a lot of more recent arrivals. Some of these diseases have been around for over a century. Others are fairly new on these shores. And so this is something that, you know, every tree owner should be aware of what, and we, and this is the sort of question Mike and I get a lot, what's happening to the tree in my front yard? And so if you're aware of what species of tree you have, you'll know which types of pests it'll be susceptible to. And because of this increasing number of pests and pathogens, there's been a lot of research at the Cary Institute on the effects of these pests and pathogens. And full disclosure, I should tell you that I did used to actually work at the Cary Institute in a lab that was focused on this specific problem. And so one of the wonderful programs that has come out of that is Tree Smart Trade. And this is the idea that if you can prevent these outbreaks from happening in the first place, the damage won't be as bad. Um, the amount of economic damage that's done by these pests and pathogens is overwhelming. It's just an enormous amount of, of damage that's done and it, it's a huge financial burden. And so this program looks at ways to prevent those pests from getting here in the first place. So they have you know, five suggested actions through policies and um, other avenues that could reduce the importation, accidental importation of these pests such as you know, using pest-free packaging materials. A lot of these invasive insects are bark boring beetles like the Asian longhorn beetle and the emerald ash borer. And they have arrived here in solid wood packing materials like wooden pallets that come in on international shipments. 
So reducing the use of that untreated wood and shipping, um, increasing funding to um, expand rapid response programs and other programs that are able to identify and immediately um, mitigate any new pathogens and pests that are coming in. So it's a wonderful, wonderful program. You should definitely check out treesmarttrade.org to learn more about that. Now, getting back to why should we learn about trees? Well, the trees are just cool. You know, it's not just that they reduce the summertime temperature of your house when you're, you've got a nice shade tree nearby. They're just incredibly interesting organisms. There is so much that we still don't know about them. And trees are good neighbors. They are extremely huggable. And I have been telling people since the pandemic started, it's tough that we can't hug our friends and family, but you can still hug a tree. They're always gonna be there for you. And so when it comes to identifying trees, I like to think of it as meeting the neighbors. And it can seem a little overwhelming. There's a lot of trees. And even with one species, there's a lot of variation. Young trees look much different from old trees. So I like to think about it as meeting the neighbors. You move to a new neighborhood, how do you meet everybody? You don't invite all 200 of your closest neighbors on the block to you know, come over and meet them all at once. You'd never remember who was who. Meet them one at a time and get to know them so that you can recognize them. And so you know a little bit more about them, you can put them in context. And that's how I approach tree identification. Just take it one at a time, pick out the tree that's closest to your house figure out what it is. And there's a lot of tools that you can use. For one thing, there's a lot of field guides that are available, both beginner and advanced. And there, this is a broad range of field guides. Mike and I both have our collections of field. You can never have too many tree field guides, we think. Um, most of these focus on leaf structure and fruit, fruit and nut structures. Um, the one that I recommend most highly is the bark book, actually because it's taken all of this time for somebody to make a bark field guide. But if you think about it, leaves are only on the trees in the Northeast for you know six months out of the year. And twigs are usually so high that you can't reach them, much less tell what they look like. And you know the fruits are only on for part of the year and the flowers just come and go so quickly, but the bark is always right there in front of your face. So you'll notice as we go through tonight that I tend to spend a lot of time talking about bark. <laughs> Another thing I would suggest is getting yourself a good pair of binoculars because being able to see the upper branches and the leaves of the tree, it's actually a good way to practice your identification skills. So don't go anywhere without your binoculars. And of course, there's apps for this. Seek by iNaturalist and LeafSnap are two apps that you can download on your phone that'll help you out with tree identification. And this is one way that you can kind of think of you know, kind of broadening your perspective. If you really want to know a tree, you have to know it in all of its seasons. They look so different from one time of the year to another. You know, this tree on the far left is clearly a red maple. Those flowers are just exploding. It's early spring and that's the bright red that you can see, but it only looks like that for a couple of weeks. And then it leaves out and you can't tell it from the other maples without looking a lot closer. So if you really want to know a tree, you want to know its shape and its color and through all of the different seasons. Look at it. It's not enough to just know it in the summertime. You got to know it in the wintertime too and the spring and the fall. Now, luckily, when it comes to tree identification, a lot of trees have very distinctive characters. They're much like people in that way. There are people that you can recognize from a long ways away just by how they walk. And so that's what we're gonna focus on this evening is these distinctive characteristics. So as opposed to going through very methodical, this is what this tree looks like, and this is what its twig looks like, and this is what its bark looks like, we're going to give you all of that information. And like Mike said, you'll get this presentation later so you can refer to it. But mostly we're gonna be focusing on those individual characteristics, whether it's a twig or a bark or a nut or whatever, is the one thing that when Mike and I are out looking at trees, it says, that's what that tree is. I know what that is. It's that very distinctive character that really jumps out at you. So here's an example. I don't have to tell you who these guys are. And this is the notation we're gonna be using when we get into our tree identification later on. Stars and arrows, you'll see them pointing at those distinctive characteristics that we want you to take special note of. So I don't have to tell you this is Indiana Jones. You know that hat, don't you? 
And I don't have to tell you that's Darth Vader because who else wears a cape like that? Okay, his hat's pretty distinctive too. So we wanna really focus on those distinctive characteristics, whether it's the general shape and growth pattern of the tree, the bark color and texture, the twig general formation, shape of the buds and the seeds, nuts, whatever the tree has as a reproductive structure. And so now we're gonna switch over to the video. So let me pull this up. This is our informal walk in the woods. If we could have done this in person, this is approximately what you would have experienced. Um, I'll just apologize in advance that it's really hard for me to talk to a camera about trees instead of a group of people. <laughs> so can everybody see that? Wait, that doesn't work. Hang on. Okay, switch over. Okay. Okay, now what's this big tree right here? You know, at eye level, it's got this kind of nondescript bark that doesn't really tell me a lot. But luckily, this is one of the trees that you don't even really need to get close to to be able to tell what it is. Now look all the way up the trunk. And you can see up at the top, the bark is very smooth and white. You might almost think it was a paper birch. It's such smooth white bark. But as you look down the trunk, the bark kind of breaks up and it becomes this amazing combination of this flaky brown and green bark. And then way at the bottom, it's just sort of nondescript gray chunky bark. So this is one of those trees where you don't even need to look at a twig to be able to tell what it is. This is a sycamore. It's the only one in our area that looks like that. Now way, way up at the tree, if I had my binoculars, I would be able to see the round fruit, um, fruit pods on the sycamore tree. Those are left over from last year. But this is one of those trees that's really, really easy to tell from a distance just by the bark. And those seed pods are really distinctive as well, if you can see those. Now here we have an evergreen tree of some sort, but we gotta figure out which one it is. So looking at the general form of it, I can see that it's got multiple trunks on it. That's actually really common in, in white pines. There's a bug that gets into the top of the tree when it's young and kills the leader part of the tree. So the branches come out and become co-dominant. And look up at the, at the very top, you can see the branches kind of have a poofy shape. White pines always look kind of poofy to me. So right now I'm pretty confident that this is a white pine just because it's got the multiple trunks and that sort of poofy shape at the top. But is there any other clues that I could look for? Aha, here's one. So this is a branch that has clearly fallen out of this tree. It's got these really long needles on it. And I'm gonna look at the bundles. You can see the needles are on the twig and bundles. And if I take off one little bundle, I can count the needles and see one, two, three, four, five needles. So that tells me for sure, this is a white pine. So here we have another pine tree. It looks a lot like the white pine, but there's some differences that tell us that this is a different species. So you can see it has the same kind of tall growth habit with sort of poofy foliage up at the top, but there's some differences here as well. Now the bark closer to the ground is kind of platy. It has a lot of kind of flat surfaces on it. Um, and as you look higher up on the tree, you can see the bark gets kind of peely and is, is varying shades of orange. It can actually be really bright orange. So that's what tells me this is a Scots pine. It's got that orange bark at the top. The bottom bark is a little platier. If I could find a branch on the ground, I would find um, needles in bundles of two that are shorter and stiffer than the white pines and kind of twisty. Um, but in the absence of being able to find a twig with needles on it, I can still tell what it is just by looking at the bark. Okay, I'm standing here with two pretty easy to identify trees. This, you can see this light gray kind of chunky bark. That tells me this is probably a white oak. The other clue that's easy to spot at this time of year is these dead leaves that are still on the tree. Now that is something, this is your big word for the day. That's called marcescence, when a tree doesn't drop its leaves in the fall, but it hangs on to those dead leaves. That's common in oaks, both red and white. You'll see that very commonly. And also on beech trees. 
but with the white oak that characteristic that you'll really look for is this bark this light gray kind of chunky bark that just tells you this is a white oak tree then look at the dead leaves and you've got your confirmation now this tree right behind me you can see some interesting patterns on the bark and they're interesting and also sad because what's happening to this tree is it's being killed by an invasive um, forest pest insect a beetle that's been invading our area for a while so what's happening is the beetle gets in and then woodpeckers um, tap into the tree to get the larvae out so you see all this bark coming off you can see all the way up and down the tree patches of bark have been taken off by the woodpeckers and because this bark is has these sort of narrow crisscrossing ridges and is that sort of medium gray color that tells me this is an ash tree and it's being killed by the emerald ash borer now here's a fortunate circumstance this tree actually has buds right at ground level for us to be able to look at so here's a combination of characteristics that tells me what this tree is it's got these zigzaggy shaped twigs with really really pointed buds on them you wouldn't want to get that in your eyeball it's got these leaves from last year that haven't been shed yet remember that's called marcescence and it's got this really smooth light gray bark so all of those put together tells me that this is a beech tree the american beech has this wonderfully smooth gray bark it tends to not lose its leaves in the fall so you'll see them rattling on through the spring and these twigs with those very very pointy buds okay what do we have here this one's a little tricky the branches are so far up in the air there's no way i can get a twig if there were any fruits on it last year they're long gone by now so all i have to go on is the bark but luckily this one's pretty easy to spot with its bark it has this kind of platey sort of feel to it a lot of flat surfaces on it but it's also kind of chunky and and sort of break peeling off a little bit at the edges so that makes me think this is a black cherry it has bark that looks we always say this looks like burnt potato chips it's kind of um, rounded around the edges of the plates on the bark and it's got that kind of dark brown color almost a little bit of red in the bark as well so my thought is that this is probably a black cherry but all i have to base that on is the bark now here's another tree that has kind of brownish gray bark that's broken up into a lot of chunks in some ways it looks kind of similar to the black cherry that we looked at before this is actually a black birch and the way i can tell the difference is by looking carefully at the bark I can see on some of the sections of bark it still has remnants of the horizontal lenticels which are little breathing apertures um, in the tree's bark but look at the way the plates are broken up on the black cherry those platey pieces tend to come off in kind of irregular a little more rounded and jaggy around the edges whereas these tend to be a little more square and straight at the edges of those plates now this tree is way too tall for me to get a twig but the best way to tell the difference between a black cherry and a black birch is the smell if you can get a hold of a twig and just scratch the bark on it a black cherry is going to have kind of a bitter almond smell and these black birches have the most intense amazing wintergreen smell that you will want to keep one of those in your pocket with you all right i hope everybody enjoyed our little walk in the woods uh, that was a kind of a general sense of what we what we usually like to do when we when we take people out on a in-person program you probably noticed that i often rely on bark for tree identification and i will be the first to admit to you that i am not great at twig id so if you think that's a little bit daunting and challenging to learn the twigs i totally agree with you um, twigs are usually so high up in the air that I've just never been able to get good at it. Bark's always right there where you can see it. So let's talk a little bit about using a, a key. These are often called dichotomous keys. Dichotomous means split into two. And they can seem a little bit daunting and maybe a little overly scientific. Um, but once you get the hang of it, these are not difficult to use at all. It's a systematic, methodical way to work your way through different characteristics of the tree or plant and it's basically a process of elimination and so keys are always set up in the same way it's a series of couplets and each couplet asks you to look at one particular characteristic of the tree and decide which one it is is this twig opposite branching or is it alternate branching 
If opposite, go to page seven. If alternate, go to page 27. So that's kind of the general way that keys are set up. It's a process of elimination. Don't be daunted by them. You, you can definitely do this. There's a lot that are available in book form. These are a couple of keys that I've used. The one on the left is from a book, one of my dad's books when he was growing up that was published in 1909. So tree keys go back a long ways. There's also online options, and we'll send you these links with the materials post-program. The Arbor Day Foundation and Virginia Tech's Dendrology Program both have great online dichotomous keys, which do the same thing. It asks you a question, click on which of the two possible answers it is, and it'll lead you on to, through the process of identifying the tree. So let me just quickly run you through the basics of how a key works. So this is a key that Mike and I tend to use when we're doing in-person programs. Like I said, there's a lot of different types of keys and this is only one of them. So we're gonna identify the twig in the top right corner of your screen. So always start with number one. Is this an evergreen or deciduous leaf on this twig? Well, pretty obvious to me that this is an evergreen. So that takes me to couplet number two. Are the leaves broad and flat like blades or are they linear, needle-like, scale-like, or all-like? Hmm. Well, they're definitely not broad and flat. So I'm gonna say they're linear, needle-like, scale-like, or all-like, and that takes me to number five. Number five, are they needle-like or are they other than needle-like? Okay, that's kind of a broad question. By other than needle-like, they're referring to the other choices in the previous question, which were scale-like or all-like. Now these definitely look needle-like to me, so I'm going for number six. And now it's asking me, are these leaves in bundles of two to five or are they scattered, stiff, more or less four-sided? So you, if you had this twig in your hand, you would definitely be able to answer this. But since it's a picture, I'll just tell it to you. These, leaves, uh, these needles are in bundles. And this particular one is in a bundle of five. So I can see that these needles are in bundles and that tells me that this is some kind of a pine. And the key then directs me to page 49, which is where we would be able to identify which particular species of pine it is. So we're not going to go to the pine page. We just we, we don't need to get into that much detail. But I want to just give you an overview of how a key works. Now, remember, this is kind of like one of those choose your own adventure books like we used to have when we were growing up. Maybe we still have those. I don't know. Um, hopefully we do. But I just want to say it's okay to go back. I've used keys and gotten to a place where it was very, very clear I had chosen wrong at some point. And the answer that I got was entirely not what the, what the tree clearly was. And so it's okay to go back. Some of these questions are a little confusing. They might be ambiguous. Some of the you know, vocabulary might be a little tricky. And keys are going to have a page of um, descriptions of vocabulary, different plant structures that they're asking you to look at. So there should be, you know, kind of a glossary that goes with it to explain what it is that you're looking for. But don't be daunted by them. You can do it. You just have to keep trying. It helps actually if you try to key out something that you already know what it is and see if you get the right answer. So that's a good way to practice using keys. All right. So let's launch right into our identifying tree species that are common in this part of the Northeast. So I'm gonna start with this group of trees that have the alternate branching structure. And we're gonna focus on those distinctive characteristics that really pop out and kind of skip over some of the ones that we don't notice quite so much just in the interest of time. Okay, so my first tree is the red oak. Anybody who knows me knows the red oak is always gonna be my favorite tree. They tend to be very tall majestic trees. The twigs are kind of stubby and have alternate branching with a sort of cluster of buds at the very tip of the twig. That's a pretty common oak characteristic, but it's not unique to oaks. So that sort of twig ID is a little tricky. Acorns, we all know those come from oak trees. Different species of oaks have different sizes and shapes of acorns and the caps come in different sizes and shapes too. So once you get the hang of it, you can tell an oak tree by the size and shape of its acorns. But what I usually rely on, no surprises here, is the bark. So a young oak tree, a young red oak, has this kind of greenish gray bark and it has these very distinctive vertical cracks in it that show the reddish underbark. So that's really typical in a young oak tree. The older red oaks have what I like to call ski tracks on them. So on the bark, especially on the upper portion of the tree, 
um, look up and you'll often see these sort of flattened lighter colored ridges of bark that look kind of like ski tracks. If you've ever been cross country skiing, you know, tracks kind of all over the place, kind of crossing and intersecting. So that's how I always um, recognize a red oak tree. The white oak, similar in growth habit, um, tends to be a little more sprawly than the red oaks, um, but white oaks also are generally tall majestic trees. And again, those twigs are gonna be pretty high up. You might not be able to find one. They're a little more slender generally than the red oak twigs. The acorns are generally a little more narrow, um, but they are pretty similar. They tend to be a little bit smaller. But again, I always go for the bark on a white oak tree. It always is pale gray. And um, the younger trees, you'll see the bark kind of coming off in, in sort of flakes. You'll see these sort of vertical crevices and sort of flaking off um, chunks of bark. The older bark, so this will be on the lower part of the trunk, is this very distinctive chunky gray bark. And you'll remember we saw this in the video. So it's very, very characteristic of a white oak tree. Shagbark hickory is another wonderfully majestic tree that we have around here. And as the name suggests, this one's all about the bark. So the twigs are pretty distinctive too. The end buds that you'll see are really big. Hickory buds are big and that's because hickory leaves are compound leaves. So there's a lot of leaflets all crammed together in that bud that are gonna explode into a large amount of greenery come spring. Now, one way to tell a shagbark hickory from the other hickory species that we have around here is the thickness of the husk that's on the nut. So in the fall, you'll see these great big, almost bigger than a golf ball sometimes, nuts on these trees. And the shagbark is the one that has the very thick husk. Other local hickories, like the pig nut is the next most common one, have a much thinner um, husk on them on the outside of the nut. But as the name suggests, the bark is how you identify this tree. It has this incredible shaggy bark where the bark um, separates from the trunk in these stiff vertical strips that kind of peel away from this trunk. And they'll peel away from both the top and the bottom of the strip. And some of them can be pretty, pretty large. When you see a mature shagbark hickory, you can immediately understand where it got its name from. Now the beech tree, we also saw this one in the video, remember, and beeches often reproduce through root sprouts as opposed to seedlings. And so they tend to grow in kind of dense groves and they have that quality where they don't always lose their leaves in the winter. So they are, um, the, one of the characteristics of the beech tree that I always look for is these really, really sharp pointy buds. And again, wear your safety goggles when you are in a beech grove because these will take your eyeball out. They're really, really sharp and pointy. Beech nuts are only gonna be on the tree for a portion of the year. Um, some trees aren't gonna be forming beech nuts at all. So that may or may not be something that you would be able to see at other times of the year. But again, the bark is always there for you to look at. Now, beech bark has that really smooth gray bark, but I didn't put that down as a distinguishing characteristic because maple trees, when they're very young, also have extremely smooth gray bark and can be mistaken for a beech tree. So I tend to rely more on the twigs for this one. But if you have a tree that's small enough to get a twig on, um, if it's smooth gray bark and it's got alternate branching, it's probably a beech tree with those pointy buds. If it has opposite branching, that's what'll tell you it's a maple. And Mike's gonna talk about those in a few minutes. Now on the right side, we have an example of what a beech tree looks like when it has been infected with beech bark disease. And you can see the blisters and the cankers that are forming on that tree trunk. So that tree is probably gonna die from that disease. And again, that's quite common in our area. Now the black cherry is a little bit of a tricky one. It's easy to confuse with the black birch. So I put them side by side or consecutively here. Um, one thing to look for that might indicate a black cherry tree is the photo on the left is what's called black knot disease. So you'll see these kind of cancerous looking growths on the tree branch. And that it's not unique to black cherry, but it is common on black cherry. So you may see that on the branches. The twigs are kind of nondescript. The fruit comes in these little sort of grapey kind of clusters. And, but again, that'll only be on there for part of the year. So remember, we looked at this bark in the video on the right side is the older tree bark, which has these kind of plates that are sort of 
um, pulling away from the trunk that have a sort of burnt potato chip look to them. That's the, that's the phrase I always come back to. Now the bark of a young black cherry tree is on the left and that is the sort of reddish brown with these light colored horizontal lenticels, which are those little breathing pores. Now I put this here because the next thing we're going to look at is the birch trees. And birch trees on the young bark also is reddish brown with horizontal pale lenticels. So they're really, really easy to confuse with black cherry. Like I said in the video, the best way to tell a black cherry from a black birch is the smell. The black cherries have sort of a bitter almond smell and black birch has a wintergreen smell. So let's go into the birches. I'm going to skip through a lot of the twig and, and um, bark slides because this is what you really need to know about birches. <laughs> the bark is so distinctive. These are four common species that we have in our area and you can easily tell them apart by their bark. Forget the twigs, you don't need to look at twigs. Forget the seeds, you don't need to look at seeds. The bark will tell you everything you need to know. Paper birch has this wide peeling strip um, coming off of the tree, very characteristic of a paper birch. Gray birch also has very light colored bark like the paper birch, but it always has these dark colored chevrons on the trunk. Now the chevrons form at the base of the branches. On the picture here, the branch has died and fallen off, but the chevron always remains. So at the base of every branch on a gray birch tree, you'll see that chevron. Then the black birch, we looked at that in the video, has those kind of squarish um, um, me medium gray plates peeling off. And the yellow birch is that sort of bronzy color with peeling similarly to the paper birch, but it peels in kind of tighter curls and smaller pieces. So that's just an overview of the birches. The next thing you need to know about birches is that the seeds are unique to species, but you're gonna need a microscope to tell the difference. But they all appear in approximately the same way. They all start off in these cone structures on the left. If you break the cone apart, you get a pile of stuff in the center picture. And on the right, you can see what that cone is made out of. So the, row, the bottom row of structures is the scales that are forming the structure of the cone. The top row is the actual seeds and all birch seeds look kind of like that. It's sort of a narrow elongated oval with wings on it. They're tiny, tiny little seeds. So paper birch, tall and slender, has that peeling bark. Gray birch also tends to be kind of tall and slender, has those dark chevrons at the branch bases. Seeds are very similar. We've talked about the bark. The black birch, is a little more distinctive in terms of bark, but the twigs are pretty similar. They have those catkins at the tip of the twig often. And the black birch, we've looked at the bark already. So just remember that the birches are really easy to tell. All you have to do is look at the bark. So the last tree that I'm gonna talk about is the sycamore. And again, we covered this in the video. Um, very, very distinctive tree. The, the twigs are actually pretty distinctive. They're usually pretty high up in the air so you can't get to them. Um, but these round ball-like seed structures are super distinctive of sycamore. So you'll see those hanging on the tree sometimes even into the winter. But it's really that bark that you wanna look for. That's what's gonna tell you that is a sycamore tree and nothing else. And so that is the end of my presentation. I'm gonna stop sharing and hand it over to Mike now. And when he is pulling up his slides, I just wanna encourage you to get out there and meet some trees. Don't be discouraged by the confusing variations. They're, you know, they, they vary from one tree to another, just like people, same species, look a little different, not a big deal. You can figure it out. So uh, over to you, Mike. Okay. So Julie did a great job of talking about deciduous trees that have alternate leaf arrangements. And I'm gonna jump right in and talk about deciduous trees with the leaves oppositely arranged. We know what that looks like by looking at the picture on the bottom left, a typical maple tree. And we see the leaves coming out in opposite directions. In the fall and winter when the leaves are gone, we can still tell opposite leaf uh, arrangement by looking at the twigs. We can see the buds are arranged in opposite directions. But we can also see the point where the leaves were formerly attached to the twigs 
they leave a scar where the leaf was attached. And those leaf scars are visible in the bottom right photograph. And they also um, are opposite arranged. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Let's see. And Michael just want to put it in presentation mode. I thought it was. Lori, did that advance? Um, so I'm still seeing the tree identification for beginners deciduous opposite leaf screen, but it's not maximized. So I think okay. if you click maybe resume slideshow. Leslie, do you have any input? Yeah, so it's not in presentation mode. So what you wanna do is get it in presentation mode. So let's see here. Um, I'm gonna start over. Okay. If everybody bears with me, I appreciate that. Now it's in presentation. Okay, thank you for your patience. So thanks, Julie, that was a great job addressing trees with alternate leaf arrangement. So now we're gonna look at trees with opposite leaf arrangement. And here's some examples, as I mentioned before, the bottom right slide shows not only the buds arranged in opposite, but also the leaf scars left from last year's leaves. Uh, People who uh, look at trees know there are relatively few species here in the Northeast that have opposite leaf arrangement. And they've developed some simple phrases to try to remember them. One of them is the acronym Mad Cap Horse. Uh, M stands for maple, A is for ash, D is for dogwood. Cap is for caprifoliaceae, which are the shrubs like the honeysuckles, the elderberries, and the viburnums. We're dealing primarily with trees today, so we're not gonna talk about those shrubs. And then finally, horse is for horse chestnut. And so there's very few species that we would find out in our forests that have that deciduous opposite leaf arrangement. We're gonna arbitrarily divide them up into two groups, those that have stout twigs and those with slender twigs. In the stout twigs, there's a variety of the ashes, the horse chestnuts and the buckeyes, and we're going to focus just on one of those, the white ash. And then with slender twigs, they're the dogwoods and the various maples. And we'll focus on three of those. So let's start by looking at white ash. Again, this is a tree that is large, up to 100 feet tall. It prefers rich, well-drained soils. It's important for timber, many recreational equipment like snowshoes and hockey sticks and baseball bats are made from ash. It's valuable for wildlife for the seeds it produces. Uh, unfortunately, ash is one of those species that's being impacted, as Julie mentioned in the video, by that invasive insect, the emerald ash borer. And so unless we can find resistant individuals, uh, we're likely to see ash decline and perhaps be eliminated from our forests because of that insect. Up close, the characteristics that tell us that we're definitely looking at an ash, uh, particularly a white ash, are the stout twigs. And then looking at the buds and the leaf scars of the twigs. In the white ash, the leaf scar wraps around the bud, as you see in the right-hand photo. Uh, if you see that those two characteristics, you know you're looking at a white ash. The bark also gives us some easily recognizable characteristics. 
uh, these intersecting ridges with V-shaped valleys or furrows between them. Uh, gray bark is characteristic of white ash. And it's very easy to build up a picture of that in your mind and then pick these out among trees out in the forest. As we mentioned earlier, young trees often have smooth bark and are maybe more easily confused. But when you get a mature white ash, it's easy to recognize it just by its bark. That was the tree we were gonna look at with the uh, very stout limbs and stout twigs. Now we'll move on to those that have slender twigs. And the first one we're gonna talk about is flowering dogwood. Flowering dogwood is a small tree, typically 10 to 20 feet tall. It prefers rich, well-drained soils, but we find it often now in old fields and along roadsides where we've stopped mowing. Flowering dogwood is important for wildlife and it is highly valued for ornamental uses. There are lots of different cultivars out there in the nursery trade. It's shade tolerant and it used to be a really important understory tree in our forests. There was a disease called dogwood anthracnose that came out about 20 years or so and has really killed many of the dogwoods in the forests. And so it's much less common now. What we're finding is dogwoods are beginning to re-sprout in many areas um, and they're doing quite well when they're in full sun. So we may see dogwood continue to be an important tree uh, in our landscapes, but maybe not necessarily in amongst the shade in the forest itself. Up close, we can easily recognize dogwood by some of the characteristics of the twigs, the slender twigs, and the fact that it has separate buds for vegetation, for leaves, and for flowers. The vegetative buds are narrow and pointy. The flower buds are much broader. Many people describe them as looking like a chocolate kiss. And the flower buds also are attached to the twig with a short stalk. So if you see those uh, characteristics on a twig, you're probably looking at a flowering dogwood. I think the easiest way to tell flowering dogwood, again, is by looking at the bark. Uh, people describe the bark of this tree as having an alligator, hard, an alligator hide uh, appearance. And you can see from these two photos that that's quite true. So it's easy again to, to see this and recognize these out in the, in the forest as being flowering dogwood, a great little tree. We'll move on to the maples. And the first one we're gonna consider is sugar maple. A large tree prefers deep, rich, well-drained soils, but it will grow pretty much anywhere. It's important as a timber tree for furniture, the wildlife use it for seeds and for places to live. Uh, it's a great ornamental. And of course, everyone enjoys maple syrup. Sugar maple, like many of the maples, is very shade tolerant and it eventually will replace other species like oaks in a climax forest um, as, as those other species get shaded out. Up close, it's easy to recognize sugar maple by the slender twigs that are the same color as maple syrup. It has brown pointed buds um, and the flowers come out after the leaves. So those are easy characteristics. We all recognize the fruit of sugar maple on the bottom of this slide with the two winged key, or it's also known as a double Samara. Uh, many of the maples have those, uh, but the shape are often quite different between different maples. Again, the bark of sugar maples can be used to tell them apart in the field. The young bark may look smooth, but often starts to look like cracked old paint as it gets larger. The best characteristic for recognizing sugar maples is the vertical strips that develop in the larger trees. Those strips separate away from the trunk on one side only, and that's characteristic of sugar maples. As the tree gets older, those vertical strips may start to fall away, crack on different sides, but you can always still find a few of those vertical uh, strips that are separated on one side on a sugar maple, and that's a key characteristic that makes them easy to find and identify in the field. Another maple species is the red maple. This is a medium tree that grows in lots of different habitats. It will do on dry sites, it will do on wet sites, but it tends to outcompete other tree species in wet areas. 
So this is a photo of a red maple swamp here at Cary Institute showing what the trees look like in that habitat. Red maple is primarily used for low value wood products, but it is highly valued for its fall foliage. And so it's an important ornamental. And like sugar maple, it's shade tolerant. And so it becomes a dominant in later stages of forest development. Red maple is easily identified from sugar maple and the other maples by, by looking at the twigs. The twigs are much more reddish than the other maples and it has two different kinds of buds. It has round flower buds and then it has oval vegetated buds. And sometimes you can find them on separate twigs and in other cases um, you may find one twig is predominantly one or the other. The flowers open first, which is another good indicator. It's a red maple and they're quite beautiful. And it's one of the first indicators that spring is on the way. And of course the two wing keys or double Samaras are shown in the bottom. And again, they're characteristic of different maples. The bark of red maple helps to easily recognize that species. Uh, young bark can be gray and smooth and then eventually starts to split and develop shallow fissures like we see in the middle. Old trees have long scaly bark with scaly shaggy ridges. If you run your hands across it, those ridges will snap off and you can see reddish bark underneath. So old red maples are quite easy to recognize once you get a picture of what the bark looks like. We're gonna switch now and look at some of the common evergreens that are found here in the Northeast. We're going to divide them into three groups based on the characteristic of the leaves. The first of these are needle like leaves that are grouped together in bundles and we've already seen a couple of examples of those in the video. The second are trees that also have needle like leaves, but they're attached individually to the twigs. And then finally, we're going to look at trees that have scale like leaves. So the trees with needle like leaves that are evergreen that are grouped in bundles are the pines. We have a number of native species. The one we'll talk about is the eastern white pine. And there are many non native species that have been planted here. And we give examples in this slide and we'll briefly talk about the Scots pine. This is how eastern white pine might appear as you approach it in the landscape. It can achieve really a beautiful shape with a single tall trunk, or as Julie pointed out in the video, it can become multi stemmed and oddly shaped if the leader gets damaged when it's a young tree. But in any of these, it's really quite an extraordinary tree. Up close, the single feature that we've already mentioned that tells you it's a white pine is that it has needles in bundles of five. And there's no other native pine here in the Northeast that has needles in bundles of pine. So that's an easy way. The cones are long and thin and are quite um, characteristic. You see them on the bottom there. They can also be really useful. The bark also is a good characteristic. Unlike many of the pines, the bark of a white pine, uh, when it gets older, is ridged with furrows in between. Most of our pines have a scaly or a platy bark. So Eastern white pine is often very easy to tell by the shape of the bark. This is that non-native pine we talked about earlier. Scots pine is from Europe. You can find different growth forms depending on what part of Europe the seed came from. It's commonly was used as a forest replacement tree and now it's often planted as a Christmas tree. Up close, the characteristic you can look for are the bundles of needles, two stout twisted needles, and the cones. Um, but the real, the easiest way to tell this tree is by again looking at the bark with the shaggy bark on the upper trunk, uh, giving way to uh, dark gray brown and plate like bark on the bottom. So that's the best way to tell Scott's pine. We're going to switch now and go from the evergreens that have their leaves or needles in bundles to those that are attached individually on the twig. And we'll look at three different groups, the hemlocks, the spruces, and the firs. Eastern hemlock is a really beautiful native tree. It often mixes with hardwoods in mixed forests. 
on northern and eastern slopes where there's high, higher moisture, you can get almost pure stands of hemlocks. They provide really important habitat for both terrestrial and aquatic organisms in those areas. And unfortunately, again, this is one of our native trees that's being threatened by an invasive insect, the hemlock woolly adelgid. Up close, eastern hemlocks can be identified by several characteristics. Their needles are flat. They lay on one plane attached to the twigs. Needles are dark above. And if you turn the branch over, you see there are white stripes on both sides on the underneath. If you look very closely at an individual needle, you can see the needle attaches to the twig by a narrow stalk. And so that's a great characteristic to look for. When you're looking at twigs and things like this, it's often good to have a hand lens with you. Uh, if your eyes are getting as bad as mine, it makes life a lot easier to see characteristics up close like that. Like many trees, the eastern hemlock bark varies with age, but it's reddish and scaly when it's young and turns dark with ridges and furrows as it gets older, much like a white pine. Uh, you could confuse that bark potentially with white pine. The color is a little different, but if you look at the foliage in, in combination with the bark, you'll know exactly what you have. Now let's consider the spruces, and we'll use the example of a non-native species, the Norway spruce. Norway spruce were originally from Europe. It's one of the most widely planted spruces for Christmas trees, for timber production, Many homeowners will plant Norway spruce and other spruces because they have some deer resistance to deer feeding. The easiest way to see and determine a Norway spruce is to look at the droop of the branches. And from even a great distance, you can see that the uh, small branches that hang off main branches uh, droop down almost, almost uh, vertically on these, this species. And so you can tell that from a great distance. Up close, like most spruces, Norway spruce has sharp, stiff needles that surround the, all the way around the twig. The twig. Um, botanists give that term of needles going all the way around the twig, the twig as, as the needles being whirled around the twig. And again, the needles in this case grow from a tiny peg that remains on the twig when the needle falls off. So if you see a dead branch on a Norway spruce, you see it has all these little tiny pegs still on it. And that can be an easy characteristic to tell the species. Uh, the bark of Norway spruce is also a good way to tell it apart from other uh, evergreens. It's very flaky in appearance. It can be sort of reddish brown when it's young. And I think the characteristic that jumps out at me often is mature trees have almost a purplish coloration to that uh, flaky uh, platy bark that you see on the right. We'll move on now and talk about a different, a different group. We're going to look at the firs and in this case we'll talk specifically about balsam fir. It's an important timber and wildlife species. Many people associate the aroma of balsam with Christmas trees and with vacations in northern forests. It's not found here in southeastern New York in our immediate area, but it can be very common at higher uh, latitudes and at higher elevations, both in New York and in New England. Up close, a combination of soft, flat needles that are not attached uh, by any kind of peg or stem is a good characteristic to tell the firs. Balsam fir, you can see that um, there are stripes on the bottom of the needles as well. And another great characteristic for identifying balsam firs is as the branches get older, the needles tend to bend upward. So even though they're coming out mostly from the side of the twig, it looks like most of the needles are located on top of the, on top of the twig. Um, if you happen to find a tree that has cones, that's a great way to determine if it's a, a fir of any kind and balsam fir in particular, because the mature cones point straight up off the branches. And when the cones get older, they lose all those scales and you're left with the candle-like central stalk still remaining on the branch, uh, quite characteristic. 
balsam fir bark gets blisters as it's mature. And these blisters are filled with an aromatic uh, liquid resin. And so that's another good characteristic. You can see the difference in the smoothness versus the roughness of this species as you go from young trees to older trees. Finally, we're gonna look at those uh, evergreens here in the Northeast that have scale-like leaves. There's a number of different species that are uh, located in New York and New England, but we'll focus on one, the Eastern Red Cedar. Um, Eastern Red Cedars are small to medium-sized trees. We commonly see them in abandoned fields and old pastures, particularly where there are limestone derived soils. They provide important food and cover for wildlife. Their seeds are widely used by birds in the winter. I spent quite a bit of time this last winter watching robins and bluebirds foraging for the, flu the blue berry-like cones in the red cedar just outside my window here. Um, so it's a great wildlife food. Up close, eastern red cedar can have both scale-like and needle-like foliage on the same tree and even on the same branch, as you see in the top photo in this slide. It shows both the needle-like and the scale-like shape of the foliage. Uh, the bottom photo shows uh, male and then female cones. Uh, the female cones are those blue-like, berry-like structures you see on the bottom right. And those are the things that are so attractive to wildlife. Another easy characteristic to identify Eastern red cedar is the reddish brown bark and it often appears to be uh, in vertical strips that peel away from the tree. You can see even on the young tree on the left, we're starting to see some of those bark strips begin to peel away. And of course, if you were to cut a red cedar, you'd see that beautiful aromatic heartwood, bright red, and it's the aroma we associate with cedar chests and cedar closets. So quite a valuable tree to have in the landscape as well as for people to use. So there you have it, a quick review of some of New York's common trees. And uh, I think we'll go, I'll stop sharing and we'll go to questions. Super, um, my name is Lori Quillen and I'm the Director of Communications at Cary Institute. I'm gonna be asking Julie and Mike some of the questions that you all put in the Q&A. Um, one of the first questions we have is coming from Western Philadelphia. Um, near Valley Forge Park. And the participant was mentioning that there's a huge spotted lanternfly infestation in the area and was hoping you could comment on that and how best to prevent spotted lanternfly. Hmm. Well, spotted lanternfly is a new insect that's um, come into the United States. Um, it has just been found in a couple of places in New York. It is currently not here in our area. We hope it doesn't arrive or doesn't arrive too soon. Um, right now, I think the focus that I'm hearing about is to try and identify where it is and they're hoping to take steps to eradicate it um, if they can catch it early enough. I'm not familiar with the specific um, pest management methods that they're planning to use for that species. Julie, do you know? I do not know the details on what the management recommendations are, but I think any place where it has been found, there's likely a hotline either through a state department of environmental conservation or cooperative extension or something like that. Um, this is a really high priority to find and eradicate this insect because it's one of its target or several of its target species are high value agricultural crops like I, apples and grapes I think are the ones that it targets. Also very interestingly the spotted lantern fly is very attracted to ailanthus trees which is a very common invasive in our area. So yeah this is an emerging high priority insect and if you do have it in your area I would urge you to become familiar with what the insect looks like, what the egg masses look like. And if you find it, find your local hotline and, and call and, and see if you can get that eradicated before it spreads anymore. In New York State, the um, lower Hudson prism 
which is the Partnership for Invasive Species uh, Management, is working to try and uh, identify places where it may be appearing. And so you could go to LH PRISM and find more information from them on the most recent sightings and potentially what kind of uh, methods could be used to control it. That's great. And we have a two-part question on cedars. So one is, do Eastern, do Eastern red cedars have both male and female seeds? So I'll let one of you answer that. And then the other part of the question is, how are junipers and cedars related? They look so similar. I believe they do have separate male and female cones. Um, and the, co the female cones are what, uh, um, when they mature, look like those blue berry-like structures. Um, so my best knowledge is that, yes, they are separate male and female cones. And Julie's gonna look it up if she can. And in terms of the relationship between cedars and junipers, um, the name Eastern Red Cedar is actually a misnomer. It's not a cedar, it's actually a juniper. The Latin name is Juniperus virginiana. Um, and I think they may be closely related, but they are in different genera. And so they're, they're different uh, groups of trees. Mm. Yeah, I'm looking it up in my book and it seems the, so there's the cypress family, which is the junipers. And then the cedars are a are Thuja genus as opposed to Juniperus. They're a little complicated. There's a lot of different genera and the common names. This is why we use scientific names instead of common names because it can be very confusing that a, what we call a cedar tree is actually a juniper. And we had both folks on um, the Zoom call and people tuning in via Facebook asking about the best tree key identifying book that you both recommend. Folks are open to also having recommendations on websites. So I wanted to be sure that one got in. My guess is that both Julie and I would pick keys based on which book we started with. And so it may not necessarily be the best, but it's what we're most used to. Uh, every author's key has great features and some gnarly things that will drive you crazy because they're made by humans. And so my recommendation would be to look at a few of them and see what jumps out at you and try it and keep using it. A good starter one, if you wanna start small, is these, these little tree finders. It's called a winter tree finder and it's by May Thielgard Watts. This is one of the ones, there's a photo of this in the presentation. This is the one I started with in botany class and these are only about $6 each. So if you wanna start with kind of a little intro, basic beginner's key, that was what I used in my botany class in college. And there's a whole series of those, isn't there, Julie, for different kinds yes, of trees? Yes, there's a tree finder, there's a winter tree finder, there's a flower finder and a berry finder, and there's a whole series of them. Nice. So a few maple related questions. We have um, someone asking what causes bird's eye maple in maple wood? And then also several folks interested in Norway maples, both the semi-invasive nature of the species and how you might go about identifying sugar maples and Norway maples when they're very young and distinguishing between the two. I can't give you an answer why bird's eye maple forms. It's something structurally within the wood. Um, I, yeah, I'm not sure either. I, I, a lot of those patterns are caused by fungi that are growing in the structure of the wood, but I'm not positive that's what causes bird's eye. In terms of Norway maple, it is a non-native tree, but it has been planted here in the U.S. for probably a hundred years. Um, it's still planted as a street tree because it's very um, tolerant of, of uh, pollution. Um, it looks something like the other maples, although the bark is very different. The bark is very dark and to me looks more like an ash tree than a maple tree. Uh, the easiest way to tell a Norway maple, regardless of how big it is, is if it's during the growing season, if you break off a leaf, you will see the end of the, the petiole or the stem of the leaf will develop a little white uh, blob of sap. And that doesn't happen with any of the other maples. 
Nice. We have a very specific question for Julie. On the black cherry tree branch she showed earlier, there was a growth on the tree. Uh, one of our participants has something very similar happening in their yard and was curious what might have caused the growth. Um, I think that might be the black knot fungus that you're talking about. So that does appear commonly on cherry trees. But I there's a number of other species that it's also fairly common on. I think apple is another one, Mike. I think some of the fruit trees. It's on all of the prunus, so cherries, plums, uh, those kinds of trees. It's typically not found on apples or pears, but any prunes, apricots, plums, cherries, it would be possible. Okay, like to the, the stone fruits, exactly. generally. Okay. And we've had a, several folks inquire about eating acorns. Any thoughts or comments there? I know there's a process. I know it's not easy. Yes, I'll say I've never eaten acorns, but I know that you can. Um, the interesting thing about this, to me anyway, is uh, so oaks are split into two broad groups, the red oak group and the white oak group. And the red oak group has the pointy leaf tips and the white oak group has the rounded leaf lobes. Um, but what's interesting about them is the acorns. All of the oaks from the red oak group um, when they drop their acorns in the fall, they stay on the ground over the winter and they don't sprout until the following spring. And so those acorns have a lot of tannins in them. So the tree puts a lot of metabolic energy into creating these really distasteful compounds that theoretically will hopefully prevent wildlife from eating all of the acorns over the winter so that there's still a few left to sprout in the springtime. Now the acorns in the white oak group come down in the fall and immediately sprout. They immediately put out a little shoot, put the little root into the ground and they get started. So those acorns in the white oak group don't have the high level of tannins in them. Um, remember it costs a lot of metabolic energy to make those complex chemicals. And so the, um, if you don't need them, you, you wouldn't go to the trouble of producing them. So the white oak acorns sprout immediately, so they don't have all those distasteful tannins in them. So my understanding is if you're gonna eat acorns, you should pick some from the white oak group, which would include white oaks and chestnut oaks, as opposed to the red oaks. But there's a lot of washing and boiling, and the whole point of preparing acorns is to get the tannins out because they're not just nasty, they're kind of toxic too. They'll make you sick. But it's a very common food from the Native Americans. It was, it was a very common food source. So we have a question about, we have a participant that often visits a singular majestic sycamore in the middle, middle of a meadow. And they're wondering why is there only one tree considering the thousands of seeds that this tree drops every year? Um, there, I, I'm thinking of, of uh, it's probably not the same tree, but I know of a very enormous majestic sycamore in our area that shades about a half of an acre. It's in the middle of an agricultural field. So that explains why there, it hasn't sprouted because um, the, the field is planted to crops. But um, if this is not an agricultural field, I'm not sure why there wouldn't be some seedlings there. You wanna think about that, Mike? If there's anything- uh, Unless the field gets mowed occasionally, I can't think of why one of those thousands of seeds that are produced each year hasn't made it. but. You know, it's all, it's all a game of chance. Yes. And we have a question about, let's see. After all these years, why hasn't a prevention for chestnut blight been discovered? And can we bring back the chestnut forest? So there are a couple of different groups that are working to try and do just that, uh, with the American Chestnut Society being one of them. Um, they're working on trying to cross uh, American chestnuts with, uh, am I getting this right, Julie, with Chinese chestnut and then cross back. So you increasingly uh, up the amount of genetics that comes from American chestnut to try and develop uh, an individual plant that is uh, resistant to the blight. There's another group at the College of Forestry at Syracuse who are working at um, genetically modifying American chestnut to try and make it resistant to the blight. And I think both groups have had some success. And I think within a few years, we will start seeing blight resistant American chestnuts uh, available for putting out 
um, to try and start to develop more of these and eventually hopefully to reinstate them into our forests. Julie? Yeah, it is a very lengthy process. Trees have a very long lifespan. You know, you could breed a hundred generations of fruit flies in a year, but trees take a long time to go through those multiple cycles of crossing and back crossing that you need to get that resistance into the genome so that they can resist the blight. So patience is definitely important when you're working with the trees. But, I, but like Mike said, we, we're getting closer. We're much closer to having survivable chestnuts. Very specific question. Which tree in the Hudson Valley has the deepest root system? Hmm. I don't know. I do know the oaks tend to have a taproot. And so my guess is probably one of the oaks, perhaps white oak or red oak may be one of the candidates. What do you think, Julie? I would guess that as well because of the taproot. Although just in general, I want to point out that trees mostly don't root as deeply as you think they do. Um, something like 90% of the tree's roots are in the top 12 inches of soil. And I think at least 95% are in the top 18 inches. So the way I describe it is if you picture a wine glass on a dinner plate. So the stem of the wine glass is the trunk of the tree, the glass is the canopy of the tree, and the dinner plate is the root system. The root system extends quite far out beyond the canopy of the tree, and it doesn't go nearly as deeply as you think it does. If you ever see a tip-up mound in the woods where a tree has fallen over and the root system comes out of the ground, you can see most of the roots are in that top foot, foot and a half of soil. Yeah, we have some folks mentioning that hickory, shagbark hickory, has a deep tap root laying in the- in Yes, the, in I'll the bet they head. do. Um, another question is about which diseases or parasites threaten white oaks in the region? Does oak wilt attack white oaks as well as reds? I'm not, that's a new enough one that I'm not totally sure. I'm not sure either, but that would be a good candidate. And the other one that's terrifying, it's not here. This is a West Coast problem that hasn't, as far as I know, made a landfall on the east coast is sudden oak death which is a phytophthora um so it's it's a blight that's related to the irish potato famine phytophthora is the same genus and that's horrifying i hope it never comes here um, because we have a lot of oak trees yeah. that could succumb to that so here's a renewal question um, i know that you mentioned that beeches and similar trees do not shed their leaves in the winter I was wondering what happens in the springtime. Do they grow new leaves and shed the old leaves then, or do the same leaves come back to life and blossom? Yeah, those leaves do eventually fall off. So if you think about it, what's happening in the fall, the leaves aren't so much falling off as they're being pushed off. So what the tree is doing, it's forming, you know, at the base of each leaf stalk, it's forming a, what's called an abscission layer. It kind of builds up a little layer of sort of a corky kind of substance that's ba basically blocking off the vasculature that connects the leaf to the tree where, you know, the sap could flow back and forth. So it's blocking that off, kind of plugging the hole. And as it's doing that, the leaf gets pushed off of the twig. Nobody really knows why marcescence happens, why sometimes the beech and the oak leaves don't come all the way off, but they will eventually pop off and underneath that is next year's bud. Nice, and, and for our final question, I think of the evening because we've been doing Q&A for 15 minutes now, it's been great. I think you've inspired lots of folks to get out there and see the woods. And we have some questions about how do you prepare folks for when they go out and explore nature? How do you make them not fearful of ticks or prepared for the ticks they might encounter? Any tips that you both have from your time in the woods? Tuck your pants into your socks. It's okay to look like a dork, people. Honestly, I'm fine with it. I would rather look like a dork than get Lyme disease. So every anytime it's above freezing, tuck those pants into the socks, check for ticks frequently. Use repellents if, if you're up for chemicals, um, but check frequently. You know, if you go anywhere with me in the woods when or anywhere outdoors, when the temperature's above freezing, you'll see me constantly looking, looking. Uh, you just get in the habit, you know. Oh, <laughs> and if you're with someone check each other you have to be so vigilant yeah wearing light colored clothing can help find ticks uh, that might be more difficult to find on dark jeans or something like that tucking your clothes in 
uh, wear a pair of gaiters if you don't want to stretch your socks out, spray them with a repellent like something with DEET or something with permethrin in it, which works very well. Check yourself when you're out there and when you come home, take a shower, check yourself again. Uh, don't be afraid to go out and enjoy nature, just be careful. Excellent, great tips. Well, that was a wonderful presentation, both of you. So, Thank you very much for all Thank for you, attending. Everyone. We'll look forward to meeting with you again. Good night. Good night. Thank you.